This program is brought to you by Emory University. Well, it is truly an honor to introduce uh, a friend, a colleague, um, and somebody that uh, goes way back in my personal history, Dr. Rod Passman this morning. I was hoping Dr. Passman would join us in person, but we'll welcome him virtually to Emory Cardiology Grand Rounds. Uh, he, he shared with me that it's 18 degrees in Chicago this morning. Uh, it's gonna be 54 and sunny here in Atlanta. Dr. Passman is the director of the Center for Arrhythmia Research, the Jules J. Reingold Professor of Electrophysiology, the Professor of Medicine in Cardiology, and interestingly, Preventive Medicine uh, at the Cardiovascular Division in Northwestern Memorial Hospital. Among his leadership roles, he's the Associate Director of EP at Northwestern Memorial Hospital. Uh, as well, he's... Um, the, uh, he won the Mentor of the Year Award at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine this past year, 2021. Dr. Passman's training over 17 years includes years at University of Pennsylvania, University of Edinburgh, and Albert Einstein. He's published over 200 manuscripts. And uh, one of the things you may not know about Dr. Passman is he's a distinguished graduate of Belmore John F. Kennedy High School class of 1981. So Dr. Passman and I literally go back to high school together on Long Island in New York, and uh, he has not changed a bit. Uh, our class of 560, he was one of our, our stars in so many different ways. And so I'm glad to introduce him this morning. He'll be speaking to us about pill in the pocket, anticoagulation for atrial fibrillation, fact, fiction, or foolish. Welcome, Dr. Passman. Uh, Larry, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, it truly is an honor for me to speak to all of you today. Uh, you know, you have such a storied cardiology program, so much of what I learned uh, through my textbooks and whatnot uh, throughout my training and, and my career have come out of your institution. Uh, my only lament is that I'm not there in person today to see uh, old friends, former fellows, uh, lots of acquaintances. Uh, but we're going to talk today about something that I hope is a bit controversial and sort of challenges the notion of AFib and stroke and brings into play some digital health technologies and how we could use that. But of course, my talk uh, would not be complete without a little visit from the past. Uh, in preparation for today's talk, I went and found actually my John F. Kennedy class of 81 year book. Uh, and let's see if I could. And this is, uh, I don't know what class this is, Larry. Is this Ms. Karis? Uh, she was a wonderful English teacher. But here is Dr. Sperling, and here is myself. Uh, I think this was some sort of organization, and uh, I got a big kick. I could only name a handful of people. I will have to go over this at some other time, uh, but there it is. <laughs> All right, so these are my disclosures, uh, and uh, I'm gonna actually start with a clinical scenario um, because most of us in academics, uh, even if we do research, spend a lot of time taking care of people. Uh, and if you're like me, uh, you remember your failures uh, much more often than you do your successes. So I first met Mr. M in 2005. Uh, at that time, he was a 66-year-old male with a history of hypertension and diabetes, so his Chad's vest score was three. He had highly symptomatic paroxysmal AFib. I had him on an antiarrhythmic drug and anticoagulation. His symptoms resolved, and every monitor that I did for the next three years showed normal sinus rhythm. Every ECG that I did showed normal sinus rhythm. Every physical exam that I did suggested normal sinus rhythm. So at that point, I had two options, right? I could continue him indefinitely on oral anticoagulation, thereby preventing strokes should he have recurrent atrial fibrillation. But in doing so, I exposed him to the risks of oral anticoagulation with a questionable benefit. The other option is I could stop oral anticoagulation and essentially keep my fingers crossed that his first sign of recurrent atrial fibrillation isn't a stroke. But with that strategy, at least I could reduce his exposure to the risks of long-term oral anticoagulation. Well, my decision then, as it was now, is easy because our guidelines are pretty clear about this. Our guidelines say that we should make decisions regarding oral anticoagulation based on stroke risk. We should not have any regard for whether the AFib is paroxysmal, persistent, longstanding persistent, or permanent. 
and no regard for whether we've adopted a successful rhythm control strategy, uh, either by antiarrhythmic drugs or ablation. So I kept Mr. M on his anticoagulation, that is until he came in with his intracranial hemorrhage. Uh, I still see him today, actually. Uh, he worked as a lawyer. He never worked again a day in his life. He is wheelchair bound, dysarthric, uh, and this event changed the trajectory of his, his life and the life of his entire family. So why do we not stop anticoagulation, right? Even when we think we've controlled the rhythm of the heart. Well, first of all, we have no cures for atrial fibrillation, right? Even surgical approaches don't cure AFib. We also recognize that a lot of atrial fibrillation is asymptomatic, right? Particularly in patients on antiarrhythmic drugs or ablation. So patients telling us that they no longer have atrial fibrillation or their AFib occurs once a year, right? That's not enough on which to base a clinical decision on. Number three is we had very little insights into the association between AF duration and stroke. Right? At that time, I had no ability to rapidly anticoagulate someone with an oral medication, nor did I have the ability to continuously monitor someone over long periods of time remotely uh, very easily. There are, however, reasons to consider stopping anticoagulation. Right? Patients do come to us hoping that we can cure them of their AFib, and even if we can't cure them of AFib, perhaps we can reduce the burden below a threshold with which the risk of stroke is actually lower. We recognize that anticoagulation has risks. Anticoagulation has costs, both from a personal and societal perspective. And number five really should be number one. Patients truly do not want to be in a lifetime of anticoagulation, particularly when you have shown them through your monitoring, your exams, and your ECGs, that their AFib has gone away and they no longer have any symptoms. So we talked about the two choices that I had for my patient, but what I'm suggesting is a third choice, right? That we stop oral anticoagulation, we monitor continuously remotely, and we give anticoagulation only as needed. And thereby we may minimize the exposure while maintaining stroke prevention. So what do we need, right? To show this sort of strategy is reasonable. Number one, we would need to prove that atrial fibrillation is in the causal pathway of stroke if we're going to respond to an episode of AFib with a short course of anticoagulation. We would need to define the AF duration associated with stroke so we know how much AFib one has prior to initiating that short course of anticoagulation. We need oral anticoagulants with rapid onset. We need the technology for long-term AF monitoring. And then we need studies to show that this approach is effective and safe. Now, this first issue may seem strange to many of us because we were taught that AFib is the cause of stroke. But actually, there are two hypotheses. I show you here an individual with an implantable cardiac monitor. These black bars represent episodes of atrial fibrillation measured in hours, and this patient has several episodes in the six to 12 hour range. The red thunderbolt is the day of a stroke. You have to ask yourself, do you believe that the risk of stroke waxes and wanes following each episode of AFib, or is the risk of stroke constant? And the episodes of AFib are simply a marker. Now, as I said, most of us were taught the former, right? That AFib causes stroke. The thrombi form during these episodes, these thrombi can embolize. And actually, this goes back 200 years. In 1814, William Ward first described a ball thrombus in the left atrium. In 1847, Virchow said that these thrombi can embolize to the systemic or pulmonary circulations. In 1909, Welch described the structure of those cardiac thrombi. And then autopsy series beginning in the 1930s found that auricular fibrillation definitively increases the incidence of auricular thrombosis. And then subsequent autopsy studies in the 1940s and the 1970s also suggested that not only in patients with mitral stenosis, but patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation are at increased risk of thrombi formation and systemic embolization. And then of course, the Framingham data in 1978 showed definitively that atrial fibrillation is associated with that five-fold increased risk of stroke. However, about 10 years ago, right, data emerged really challenging this approach. I show you three studies here. The one on the left is called the TRENDS trial. In the middle is the ASSERT trial. And in the far right is the IMPACT trial. 
And these are three studies that enroll patients with dual chamber pacemakers and defibrillators. And as you know, these devices can record all episodes of atrial fibrillation, can tell you the date the AFib occurred, and can tell you the duration of atrial fibrillation. So these three studies enroll patients with dual chamber devices. And I show you here in these three studies, those individuals who had a stroke delineated by this red uh, vertical line. The light gray that you see in the background is the period that the uh, monitoring of the device took place. And the dark black shows you when episodes of AFib occurred. And if you look at this data and mass, you would see that in many cases, episodes of atrial fibrillation happened months before the stroke. In some cases, strokes occurred in the absence of atrial fibrillation. And then there are some patients whose first episode of atrial fibrillation occurred after the stroke, leading some to put forth another hypothesis. Right? The atrial myopathy theory basically says that those patients with vascular risk factors can clearly have strokes from non-atrial mechanisms, but that these individuals may have an abnormal atrial substrate from fibrosis, stretch, decreased contractile function, changes in the, in the endothelium that promote thrombus formation even in the absence of atrial fibrillation. So even if you get rid of the AFib, right, these individuals have a propensity to stroke because of this atrial cardiomyopathy, okay? So there's a problem with the uh, temporal dissociation argument. And let me hone in on the ASSERT trial because we have the most data from this study. First of all, the number of strokes was low. Out of nearly 2,600 patients, there were only 51 strokes. The mean age was 71, the mean CHADS VAS score was five. As I pointed out, many strokes occurred with no AFib. And when AFib did occur, it may have occurred weeks to months prior to the stroke. But there's another potential uh, explanation here. Number one, many of these episodes of AFib lasted only a few minutes. And as I'll show you, uh, it's doubtful that minutes of AFib cause stroke. Number two is that thrombi can form during an episode of AFib and then grow and embolize months later. But most importantly, we need to recognize that not all strokes are due to atrial fibrillation, even in those with AFib, particularly in those with multiple risk factors. And perhaps that's the most important thing because all of these patients right, had implantable devices. In that era, no one was doing routine MRIs and no effort was made at that time of the study to adjudicate stroke mechanism. So if you're dealing with 85 year olds with hypertension, diabetes and heart failure, and they have a stroke, right? Why are you surprised that it's temporarily dissociated from a fib, right? When you've made no effort to adjudicate the mechanism of the stroke. The authors of the ASSERT trial actually did try to dig a little deeper here. First of all, as I'll show you in a minute, they really tried to focus on the fact that only longer episodes of AFib increased your risk. So if you want to look at the temporal association between AF and stroke, and if you limit that to 24 hours of AFib, you see that the risk of stroke goes up pretty significantly within a month of that prolonged episode. The other thing that they did was they made an effort to adjudicate stroke mechanism. So of the 51 strokes that occurred in the ASSERT trial, only five were thought to be cardioembolic in nature. And four out of those five occurred within 30 days of one of these 24-hour uh, episodes of atrial fibrillation. I actually think that the way to better look at this uh, is with what's called a case crossover approach. And this is a paper that uh, I published with Dan Singer uh, uh, just a few months ago in JAMA Cardiology. But really, this tries to deal with all the potential confounders in the sort of cohort studies I just showed you. And it's designed to assess the short-term impact of a time-varying exposure. So essentially what we did is we defined the case period as day minus one to minus 30 prior to stroke. We defined the control period as another period of time in that same individual, right? And in this case, minus 90 to 120 pre-stroke. And why did we do this? Well, because we were trying to account for the fact that a lot of these individuals, right, had multiple mechanisms of stroke. So we picked a period of time where they weren't that much different in age. They were unlikely to develop severe hypertension or diabetes or heart failure in that brief period of time. And in this way, we can isolate the impact of uh, atrial fibrillation in the stroke. 
and control for all those other confounders. The exposure was episodes of atrial fibrillation lasting more than five and a half hours, and the outcome was stroke. So we started actually by combining two really big databases. We linked the Optum EHR database with the Medtronic CareLink database, and we found about 470,000 patients, most of whom we got rid of because A, they didn't have a stroke, uh, B, because we didn't have robust clinical data on them, and three, we didn't have good um, heart rhythm monitoring on them. So we wound up with 891 stroke patients. And while you might say that's not an incredible number, I will remind you that this whole controversy is based on three studies that together right, had 160 stroke patients. So we are literally about five times uh, their uh, number of strokes. So the mean age of these patients was 76. Uh, we did include patients with uh, dual and three lead pacemakers and defibrillators, along with patients with implantable cardiac monitors. Uh, because these patients had devices, they were older, had multiple cardiac risk factors, and the mean CHADS VAS score was 4.9, and about 20% were already on oral anticoagulation. That's gonna be important in a moment. So remember that the, the basis is this. If, if there's no association between AFib and stroke, right, in a temporal manner, then you would expect the, um, the odds of having atrial fibrillation to be equally distributed in the case and control period, okay? There are four types of patients then that you can see. A are patients who have AFib in both the case and control period. These black lines are on their implantable device, the episodes of AFib. B are patients who had AFib only in the control period and not in the case period. C are patients who did not have AFib in the control period, but did have in the case period. And D are patients that did not have AFib in either the case of control. So the informative patients are really B and C, right? Those that were discordant in nature. And again, if the, if the risk of stroke was basically random, you would expect the distribution of AFib to be random. But that's not what we saw. We saw that the odds ratio for atrial fibrillation occurring in that 30-day period before the stroke was 3.7 compared to the control period, suggesting a strong temporal association between these several hour episodes of atrial fibrillation and stroke risk. And indeed, when we broke down when these strokes occurred, the risk of stroke was highest in the first five days following that five and a half hour or longer episode of atrial fibrillation. We vary the duration of AFib. We chose five and a half hours because that's what was used in the TRENDS trial. But regardless of what the duration was, now remember the numbers get small, the confidence intervals often cross one, but the odds ratios were always positive, became most positive, right? When you got to episodes of atrial fibrillation, again, 24 hours or longer. So the other interesting thing to point out, right, is that as I pointed out, many of these patients were not on anticoagulation, some were. If you look at the patients who were not on anticoagulation, the odds ratio of having atrial fibrillation 30 days or within 30 days prior to the stroke was 7.8. If you look at those patients on anticoagulation, it was a non-significant 1.4 suggesting again, that not only is there a temporal association between AF and stroke, but that these are cardioembolic strokes that are sensitive to anticoagulation. So the next thing we need to address is the duration of atrial fibrillation associated with stroke. Now, when we were taught uh, cardiology and AFib, we were taught that there was no difference in the type of atrial fibrillation you had and your risk of stroke. And that's why we are told to anticoagulate paroxysmal AFib in the same manner as we do permanent AFib. And that comes from studies that took place in the 80s and 90s, the SPAF trials, which distinguished these patients into either intermittent, which we would call paroxysmal AFib, or sustained AFib, um, or persistent AFib. And what they found was that there was no difference in stroke risk. But remember that these were individuals who came to their doctor with an ECG showing atrial fibrillation, right? Not the kind of AFib we may often pick up with the kind of monitoring that we do today. So while we are told that duration doesn't matter, the truth is, is that we do take 
duration into account, right? We practice the 48 hour rule, which says that someone could come in with less than 48 hours of atrial fibrillation and be safely cardioverted to normal sinus rhythm without the need for a TEE and without the need for three to four weeks of therapeutic anticoagulation. So this concept that it takes time for a thrombus to form is actually built into our daily practices. However, the era of dual chamber devices and implantable cardiac monitors that can record all episodes of atrial fibrillation have called into question how much a fib one needs to have a stroke. So for example, in this study of patients with dual chamber pacemakers, only those with 24 hours or more of a fib had an increased risk of stroke. And those with less than 24 hours were as unlikely to have a stroke as patients with no AFib at all. As I mentioned in the TRENDS trial, those with five and a half hours or more of AFib had this increased risk. In the original ASSERT trial, right, they drew the line in the sand at six minutes or more of AFib and found that those with six minutes or more of AFib occurring within the first three months of device implantation was associated with a two and a half fold increased risk of stroke, leading some to believe that all you need is six minutes or more of AFib. But remember, the authors drew the line in the sand at six minutes. When they actually looked at their data, only those with 24 hours or more of AFib depicted in the yellow line were at increased risk, and those with less than 24 hours, again, were as unlikely to have a stroke as patients with no AFib at all. I actually was never a firm believer that it was one number for all patients. Uh, we were interested in studying the interaction between AF duration, CHADS VAS score, and stroke. Uh, so what we did is, again, we went back to those two big databases, Optum, that had the clinical information on more than 11 million patients with cardiovascular disease, and the Medtronic CareLink database that had data on 1.4 million people with two or three lead devices. And from this, we got about 22,000 patients where we had, again, robust clinical information uh, and very good uh, follow-up from their implantable device. And this is a paper that we published in CERC about two years ago. Rachel Kaplan was a, um, I think a resident or a fellow at that time. Uh, she's now one of our senior EP fellows. But what Rachel did is plotted the CHADS VAS score on the horizontal axis and the maximum daily uh, AF duration uh, on the vertical axis. And the row one is no AFib. Row two is AFib six minutes to 23.5 hours. And row three is AFib uh, essentially 24 hours or greater. And we used as our threshold for anticoagulation, a yearly stroke risk of 1% per year, which some have argued is sort of a tipping point for benefiting from anticoagulation in the NOAC era. So if you have a CHADS best score of zero or one, no amount of atrial fibrillation puts you over that 1% per year mark. If you have a CHADS best score of two and you have episodes of AFib, but they're less than 24 hours, then your risk of stroke is still under 1% per year. If you have a CHADS vest score of three or four and you have no AFib, your risk of stroke is less than 1%. However, if you have a CHADS vest score of two and have 24 hours or more of AFib, your risk of stroke goes up past that 1% per year threshold. The same is true if you have a CHADS vest score of three or four with shorter episodes of AFib. And maybe not surprisingly, those patients with a CHADS vest score of five or more even with no atrial fibrillation, past that 1% per year risk. But we don't know whether these are thromboembolic strokes or whether these are strokes that are responsive to anticoagulation, but it shows you that there's this interaction between duration and CHADS VAS score. Well, the next thing we would need for a pill and pocket approach to be successful are rapidly onset uh, anticoagulants. Uh, we have those, obviously, uh, all of the NOACs or DOACs. Uh, will anticoagulate you within one to four hours as opposed to the four or five days for therapeutic anticoagulation. And of course, we also have the technology available for long-term AF monitoring, right? I showed you that we can do this with implantable devices. And of course, we can remotely monitor those devices. And if we wanted to, right, we can call patients and tell them when they've had episodes of atrial fibrillation and we could restart their anticoagulation in response to that episode. So essentially the pill and pocket approach 
would leverage these advances in both monitoring techniques and uh, pharmacology to provide a personalized, targeted, time-delimited anticoagulation strategy only in response to a prolonged episode of atrial fibrillation. So how do we establish the efficacy and safety of this approach? The first study we did, uh, which was a uh, NIH R34 grant, was a pilot study called react.com, where we essentially took patients with implantable cardiac monitors, we monitored them daily, and we reinstituted their previously prescribed NOAC for 30 days in response to an episode of AFib lasting an hour or longer. So a patient who has one episode of AFib a year, right, would only be on anticoagulation for a month. A patient who has an episode of AFib every 29 days is never gonna get off their oral anticoagulation. So this is an example of a patient from that study. Uh, he has a chads vast score of three. Uh, he should be on anticoagulation every day, but this patient has a single two-hour episode of AFib over a 14-month period of time. If we monitor them daily, remotely, and gave them a month of anticoagulation in response to that episode, right? maybe we could protect this patient against stroke while avoiding the exposure to anticoagulation the other 11 months out of the year. So the study that we did enrolled 59 patients. It was single arm. Because this was a feasibility study, we focused on patients who were on anticoagulation, but were in the lower end of the chads vast scale. About two thirds of these patients had been bladed. We followed these patients for about 14 months. And one point I wanna make is that we were using an earlier iteration of the implantable monitor, where patients actually had to wake up in the morning and spend seven or eight minutes downloading the information from their implantable device. And despite this requirement, we had compliance rates of 99.7%. Because as it turns out, these patients don't wanna have strokes, don't wanna be on anticoagulation, and having daily contact with their healthcare team uh, was a very strong motivating factor for them. The other point I'd wanna make is that a lot of my colleagues in the EP community said that this approach is not feasible because if you monitor these patients very intensively, you're gonna find short episodes of AFib that you never knew about, and that you're never gonna get these people off anticoagulation. And actually that turned, turned out to be the case because only about a third of these patients had any atrial fibrillation, and those that did averaged about two episodes over the 14 month period. The other point worth noting is that 77% spontaneously cardioverted, and those other 23%, because we knew when they were started on anticoagulation, and we knew exactly when their episode of AFib began, we could whisk them in and cardiovert them without a TE and without the need for delaying cardioversion for three or four weeks. The other point worth emphasizing is that three quarters of these episodes were completely asymptomatic. And if you look at the time spent on anticoagulation versus the time these patients would have been on anticoagulation, it represents a 94% reduction in the time on oral anticoagulation. Now, there were no strokes. There was one TIA in someone with a CHADS2 score of one who was on aspirin and had no AFib. But actually, there were two major bleeds, um, both occurring off NOAC. Uh, actually, one of these patients I'm seeing uh, on Wednesday to uh, uh, give her her third ILR. Uh, about uh, several years ago, during the course of the study, she was gardening, was stung by a bee, fell and hit her head on a rock, and had a subdural bleed off NOAC because of the study. And a second patient uh, took advantage of the fact that he was off anticoagulation, was working on the roof of his house, fell off, rolled into a creek beneath and uh, uh, back of his house, and hit his flank on a rock and bled into his kidney, again, off anticoagulation. So two very, very serious bleeds may have been life-threatening uh, had they been on their oral anticoagulation. Uh, now, Larry, I must boast for a moment. Um, I, I know that you've had great successes, but uh, have you been interviewed in Popular Mechanics Magazine at, as I have? Not yet, but I look forward to it. <laughs> okay. So uh, I have no idea, but Popular Mechanics Magazine picked up on this concept and, and interviewed me. Uh, and I would say about halfway through, um, the guy realized that, you know, as opposed to most people in Popular Mechanics, you know, I really didn't invent anything here. So the guy said to me, so wait a minute, you know, you didn't invent the implantable cardiac monitor, right? And I said, correct. He goes, and you didn't invent the blood thinners, correct? I said, right. He said, so what did you do here? I said, well, 
it's kind of like I didn't invent chocolate and I didn't invent peanut butter, but I did invent Reese's peanut butter cups. So apparently someone read this and sent me this book. I did not invent Reese's peanut butter cups. Uh, so I have to retract that statement, which I'm doing publicly right here and now. So we did a second study. This was called Tactic AF. Uh, this is with Peter Zimmerbaum's group um, in Boston, where we repeated the study, but this time using pacemakers and defibrillators. And because these devices have leads in the atrium that can be very sensitive in detecting shorter episodes of AFib, the threshold for reinitiating anticoagulation was shorter. And here too, 48 patients, single arm study, 75% uh, reduction in time on oral anticoagulation with no strokes, no TIAs, and one major bleed um, occurring off NOAC. So what have we learned from these two pilot studies? Well, together they enrolled 96 patients, have 112 patient years of follow-up, show a reduction in the time on oral anticoagulation by 75 to 94%. There were no strokes, and this suggests that this approach is feasible. What we don't know is, is it safe? And how do we scale this to the millions of people in this country and the tens of millions of people around the world who may be candidates yet have no need for pacemaker or defibrillator? And whereas the use of implantable monitors for this indication is simply not scalable because of the cost involved, the invasive nature, the limited battery life of these devices, and the fact that as of today, they are physician facing, meaning the data comes from the patient to me as the caregiver, right? not back to the patient for a, a point of care treatment. And the infrastructure needed to download, adjudicate, and respond to patients in a timely manner is simply not scalable. I would say that the future of AF monitoring will be smartphone based. Uh, this is actually a picture of the Pope's inauguration in 2005. If you look closely on the bottom right, there is one person with a device capable of taking a picture and making a phone call. This is that same exact scene eight years later. There's not one person in that audience who does not have a device capable of taking a picture and making a phone call. There are more cell phone accounts uh, on this earth than there are people. And the question is, how do we leverage these advances in technology to detect and treat atrial fibrillation? Well, the easiest thing to do is you could download an app that uses the lamp on your phone uh, to measure PPG. And you can hold your finger up uh, just as you can with a pulse oximeter and it creates this waveform and the algorithm can tell you whether this is sinus rhythm on the upper right or atrial fibrillation on the bottom right. And while the reported sensitivity in research settings is, is said to be quite high. In the real world, that's often not the case. And none of us would feel comfortable treating someone for atrial fibrillation uh, based on these squiggly lines. We need to see these squiggly lines. So for those of you who, who, who have not seen these devices, which I imagine is everyone, uh, I'm a big fan of, of this device called Cardia. Uh, you could buy the single lead device on Amazon uh, for not very much money or a six lead device for a little more. And here you get an ECG that the device will read for you. The sensitivity and specificity are reported to be quite high. Uh, I think that this may be an overstatement because I've, I've seen a fair amount of false positives uh, from uh, ectopy and, and whatnot. And in about 15% of the cases, it may say that it can't give a, a reading, typically because of some uh, uh, a noise in the background. But I, I find this to be an incredibly valuable tool but the PPG I just showed you and this really just provides snapshots. And as I mentioned, I believe that there's a lot of value in AF duration. So of course, we also have now wearable devices, Apple, Samsung, and Fitbit uh, all make watches that can record an ECG. And these devices also um, have something called irregular rhythm notification, okay? So if you have an Apple watch, you could set up this irregular rhythm notification. And what this does is throughout the day, right, this little green light will go on the bottom of your watch and it will assess something called a tachygram, which is an estimate of the RR regularity. And a sinus rhythm tachygram will look like this and an atrial fibrillation tachygram will look like this. So what the Apple Watch does is throughout the day, when you are not moving, it will check your pulse. If your pulse is regular, it will then check it again in a few hours. 
If your pulse is irregular, it will increase the sampling rate. If five out of six samples over the course of 60 or 70 minutes are suggestive of atrial fibrillation, it will give you this irregular rhythm notification. And for those of you who have the watch, you can open up that ECG app. You can hold your finger on the crown of the watch and you could record your ECG for 30 seconds and it will read it right there for you and tell you whether you're in normal sinus rhythm right, or atrial fibrillation, okay? The Fitbit just produced some of its results at AHA this past year, and these slides are from Steve Lubitz. Their sensing window is somewhat different, and they're able to pick up shorter episodes of atrial fibrillation of about 30 minutes. But if you look at the data they presented, something really important needs to be emphasized. The vast majority of their episodes of AFib are detected at night during sleep. Now, it's not as though you're only having AFib at night. It's that the algorithm is not sensitive when you're moving around. The noise that it creates just overwhelms the PPG algorithm. And therefore, it doesn't check you very often during waking hours, but checks you much more often during sleeping hours. So if you want your patient to find their atrial fibrillation, right, it's best that they wear it when they're not moving during sleeping hours. Now, if you look at the Apple Heart Study, they actually didn't really give a lot of detail about their sensitivity and specificity. But we were interested in figuring this out. So this is with Jeremy Wauselauf, who was one of my fellows, who is now an attending at Rush. But we gave um, uh, Apple Watches to patients with implantable devices. And we wanted to understand how accurate the watch was for episodes of AFib lasting an hour or longer. And we told these patients to wear their watch as much as they can. The first point I wanna make is that of the 36 episodes of AFib that we saw in this 15 patient study, uh, only 20 episodes occurred while the watch was being worn. Even though the watch was on, the device only picked up about 65% of the episodes of prolonged AFib uh, by episode and about 70% by patient. The positive predicted value is high, the specificity is very high, and the negative predictive value was about 80%. Well, actually, uh, Apple saw this and they told me, well, yes, we know that, right? The watch was not designed to be a highly sensitive AF monitor for patients with a known history of AFib. In fact, uh, the story goes that um, Apple was interested in designing a watch that was an accurate heart rate monitor, right? And then people started to write letters to Tim Cook telling them that the Apple Watch quote unquote saved my life because when I was doing nothing, my heart rate was fast. I went to my doctor and was told I had atrial fibrillation, which otherwise I wouldn't have known about. However, the FDA cleared the Apple Watch for patients without a history of AFib. And indeed, if you go to set up this irregular rhythm notification, it will ask you two questions. It will ask you your date of birth because if you're under 22, it won't turn it on. And it will ask you, have you ever been diagnosed with AF by a doctor? If you say yes, it will not turn on this algorithm, right? This was designed as a screening tool and was not designed to pick up every episode of AFib. We do believe, however, that we can do better. So this is another project that we did with Jeremy, uh, where prior to the advent of the Apple Watch 5 with the ECG, uh, Cardia did make something called Cardia Band, which was a, a watch band that had a little chip in it which could basically hijack an Apple Watch 2 that had no ECG capability. And this did two things. Number one, it turned the Apple Watch into an ECG machine and it had a continuous um, uh, heart rate monitor, right? And the, and the reason Apple didn't like this is because it, it, it turned on that green light all the time and the battery would only last maybe, you know, 12 hours or so and you'd have to recharge it. But basically, this provided an opportunity to use or to design a wearable continuous AF monitor. So again, we took data from this watch, we developed a convoluted neural network, and we basically showed that you can detect atrial fibrillation, right? And here's, you can see changes in heart rate variability. This is an ECG from the watch showing a fib. You could see when this individual was in sinus rhythm, right? Heart rate variability goes to almost uh, negligible and the uh, watch confirms the presence of sinus rhythm. You could see P waves, 
but you could tell actually AF burden because you could tell when this patient wasn't wearing their watch, they have no heart rate and these green lines are activity. So no heart rate, no activity means you weren't wearing the watch. So of this period of time from 6 a.m. to 3 p.m., right, the AF burden was 20%. So we estimated or wanted to evaluate the accuracy of this watch. So again, gave 24 watches to 24 patients with implantable monitors. We used as our endpoint episodes of AFib lasting an hour or longer. And we found that this $300 wearable device had a sensitivity of 97% and a near perfect correlation between AF duration, between the $300 watch and the $20,000 implantable cardiac monitor. So can we use a wearable device to do pill and pocket anticoagulation? It would look something like this, right? The patient would stop their previously prescribed NOAC. The watch would alert them when they had an irregular rhythm. They could confirm the presence of AFib on the watch. The watch then would go into their Outlook calendar and remind them to resume their previously prescribed NOAC for the next 30 days and then stop it. The study that is currently under review at NIH is called REACT AF. This is a one-to-one -one randomized trial comparing chronic NOAC with watch-guided targeted NOAC. The primary endpoint is non-inferiority to stroke, arterial embolism, and death due to CV causes. And the secondary endpoint is superiority for major bleeds. The study, if funded, will enroll 5,500 patients at up to 80 US sites with a minimum follow-up time of three years. And this essentially will go on and off anticoagulation following an episode of AFib an hour or longer, and you would be on your NOAC for one month following that episode. Now, I won't go over all the inclusion criteria. I just want to emphasize that we are focusing in on a patient population with a low burden of atrial fibrillation, either on their own or as a result of drugs or ablation. We're focusing on patients on the lower end of the chads vast scale, one to four for males, two to four for females. And these patients are currently on a NOAC. And we're excluding patients who have a dual chamber or three lead device in or are candidates for one, which means we're essentially excluding patients with heart failure. And we're excluding patients who have a contraindication to NOAC. So if you think about this visually, right now all these patients are treated the same. You know, we believe that these patients on the lower end of the CHADS vast scale with a low or no burden of atrial fibrillation, either on their own or as a result of drugs or ablation, should be treated differently. So we mentioned that this approach may be foolish. As I mentioned, it may be foolish because those who argue about the temporal dissociation between AF and stroke, this atrial myopathy, which may exist even in the absence or resolution of AFib, right, may make the strategy a foolish approach. I would argue the way that we approach this aspect of stroke prevention and AFib is really what's foolish, right? Even in the NOAC era, we only anticoagulate about 60% of patients who should be on anticoagulation. And even when we prescribe oral anticoagulation, about 40% of these patients stop it within two years because of real or perceived risk. The other thing that we commonly do is we stop anticoagulation when we think we've achieved a rhythm control strategy. This is a study out of Mayo Clinic of nearly 7,000 post-ablation patients. These are anticoagulation uh, uh, continuation rates. The red represents patients at low risk and only 18% are on anticoagulation at the end of the year. The green are high risk patients with a CHADS vest score of two or more. And only 37% of those patients remain on anticoagulation at the end of the year. And if you look at their stroke risk, it goes up two and a half fold. So I think what makes no sense is treating all patients alike when patients are different, right? These are two patients of mine, uh, both with a history of atrial fibrillation, both 68 year old females with a history of hypertension. So based on age, gender, and hypertension, they have a CHADS vest score of three. The patient on the left has an implantable monitor, has no rhythm control treatment, and has at hours or days of AFib at a time. The patient on the right had an ablation done and her implantable monitor shows no episodes of AFib. Yet both of these patients by current standard of care are treated equally with a lifetime of oral anticoagulation. Well, um, Larry and your team, I hope you're right. Uh, I hope that prevention alone will eliminate uh, atrial fibrillation in the future.
But if atrial fibrillation cannot be eliminated with prevention, right, the strategy that I am suggesting has significant implications. We could reduce the time on oral anticoagulation and in doing so, reduce bleeding, reduce costs and improve quality of life. We could also change the indications for why we adopt a rhythm control strategy, moving it away from simply improving symptoms and towards a future of limiting or eliminating the need for chronic oral anticoagulation. I'll finish with a quote from the New York Times. It says, the notion of allowing patients to test themselves and treat themselves is outlandish to most doctors. This was not written in the year 2022 in response to what I am suggesting. This was written in the 1930s in response to this medication. So with that, I will thank you so much for your attention and we have plenty of time for questions or comments. Thank you. Rod, thank you so much. That, that was an, an incredible presentation and a really, really provocative story that I know you've been working on for quite some time. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, we'll have to get you back in person um, you know, when, when the time is right, but I wanted to open up the floor to questions or or comments, you wel you're welcome to add those to the chat as well. I'm gonna start off. I think I, I had jotted down two questions. I think you answered one of them. Was there a Chad's VAS score at which you wouldn't consider this? And I think you answered that well, but my, my question was gonna be, um, how do we think about this possibility um, without furthering the digital divide? You know, How do we maintain health equity um, when we, we do have these technologies before us that are really interesting and exciting, but of course there are costs to them. And then also just the ability uh, to navigate technology in, in populations that are low tech. Yeah, well, well, those are things that we're struggling with. Uh, I would say this, um, it's quite clear that um, anticoagulation and, and rhythm control uh, are, are not equally used across the, the socioeconomic spectrum. Uh, I will say that in our studies, about 87, or, or and not in ours, but about 87% uh, of our population owns a smartphone. Uh, and I would argue that uh, you know, if we show that this is effective, that maybe insurance should be paying for an Apple Watch because it's a hell of a lot cheaper than paying for anticoagulation and the risks of anticoagulation. Uh, I would say that you know today's uh, 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 60 year olds, by the time this is done, I mean, the, 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 the digital divide that certainly uh, I see sort of in my parents who would have difficulty navigating this, um, you know, that generation, uh, you know, uh, will be replaced by people who are quite comfortable with this technology. But I do think that we need to be very sensitive. You know, the study that we're doing, it's one of the great challenges because uh, the company we're working with, you need to own their uh, watch. I mean, their, their phone, right? It, it's compatible with their watch. Uh, and, and while 80, you know, 7% of people own a smartphone. It's not always, you know, the smartphone that we want. So um, I think that our goal is to, is to really prove that this is not only effective, but cost effective. So that this is something that, uh, that, that, that society is willing to pay for because it's better and safer and cheaper in the long run. In the React AF, have you built in um, tech support like a geek squad um, to help people who have questions? Yes, uh, yes, absolutely. And, and uh, there's a call-in center and there's a, a, a lot of testing going on. I should note that because the watch that is commercially available, uh, I think is not sensitive enough. Um, you know, we are designing a more sensitive watch specifically for the needs of this study, uh, but there will be a 24 seven call-in center. We're, we're taking volunteers, uh, Larry, if you wanna you know, be available for, for uh, the Genius Bar kind of geek squad situation. Great, well, other questions um, from our faculty, our fellows? I have a question, if I may. Um, yeah, please, Mike. Can you comment, thank you, first of all, that was great, Dr. Passman. Can you comment a little bit more on burden versus episode length? In other words, do you believe there's a difference, let's say two people, Chaz Fast 3, and uh, somebody has seven episodes of one hour, or let's say seven episodes of 10 minute long runs of AFib. And then other person has one episode of 70 minutes of AFib on it. 
Yeah, Mike, you're asking a great question. And actually, so you're talking about this issue of density, right? The two patients could have 20% of the time on AFib. One person gets it by spending, you know, I don't know, you know, two and a half months a year in continuous AFib. And the other person gets there by spending, you know, two hours a day or something along those lines. Um, you know, we tried to tease this out using those two databases, that issue of density, and, and we couldn't make heads or tails of it. The data was all over the place. So right now, I think that it's probably, I think it may be worse to have a single long episode of AFib than several short episodes. You also have to keep in mind that, um, you know, a lot of these devices will break up a long episode into multiple short ones. So like an implantable monitor, when I see episodes of AFib separated by less than 10 minutes, I actually believe that that's one long episode and there was just some regularity or the device undersent something. So um, you're asking great, great question, but uh, I, 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 the guy who sort of um, pioneered this concept is actually a, uh, a math guy and a cardiothoracic surgeon um, named Dr. Caritos in Germany. And we worked with him on these databases and we couldn't make heads or tails of it. So that question is gonna go unanswered, unfortunately, but that's uh, something that, that I ask myself, yeah. Um, there's a question in the chat. I don't know if you see it there, Rod, um, from Steve Linderman. Have you considered using two watches per patient instead of one to facilitate 24-hour continuous monitoring and avoid the watch-off events? Yeah. Well, we thought about that, but you know, um, uh, the watches are being provided in the study, uh, but two watches was, was a big ask even for the, this company. Um, but I will say this, the Apple Watch 7, uh, uh, for example, and the Fitbit charges in like less than an hour. So, you know, conceivably you could wear it all night uh, and then, you know, wake up in the morning while you're having your coffee charges. So you could have, you know, nearly 23 hours of charging, which I think is pretty darn good. One issue is, you know, why do we choose an hour of AFib? And it's partly because for those people who don't wear their watch at night, you know, if they put their watch on at 7 a.m., and at 8 a.m. get an alarm that they've been in AFib for an hour, that episode of AFib may have been an hour, but it also may have been nine hours, right? If it, if it started at one o'clock in the morning. So that's why we chose that one hour. And in our pilot study, react.com, even using that one hour threshold, we had a 94% reduction. So if we were more liberal with the threshold uh, and the study uh, showed an increased stroke risk, you know, we, we, we really wanna be as conservative as possible and show that the the strategy is correct. The same thing people ask, ask, well, why are you giving a month of anticoagulation for a single six hour episode of AFib? And it's because we don't wanna sort of get into the weeds and say, well, if you have a six hour episode, you're on two weeks of, a, of anticoagulation or a week. And if you have a, a two day episode, you're on a month. Again, if the study is negative, uh, we want to make sure that we've asked the right questions and sort of uh, uh, aren't asking how little anticoagulation someone needs in response to a short episode. Great, we have time for one more question. If uh, anybody wants to either type it in the chat or just uh, raise your hand or just come off your... Uh, I, I, I will, I, I, see, I see Dave's very kind comment. Um, uh, and, and for oh, those of us who see a lot of AFib patients, this is one of the most common questions that we were asked. You know, you've done an ablation on me uh, or I'm on, you know, drug X and I'm not having a fib anymore and why am I still on anticoagulation? And it's a very difficult discussion to have. And I think, you know, we can make our official recommendation saying, you know, our guidelines say that you should be on it, but we sort of wink, wink and say, well, you know, if you don't wanna be on it anymore, uh, you know, I believe that your risk is low. And I do recommend for patients who do that, that they get a watch or they do frequent cardia tracings or something to provide that safety net. Um, but the truth is the very little secret in the EP world is that uh, you know, it's not uncommon that we uh, don't stand in the way of patients who wanna stop anticoagulation. Because it's hard to tell a 65 year old with hypertension, they're gonna be on anticoagulation for the rest of their lives for a disease that you're not sure they have anymore. Great. Well with that, we'll close and thank you all for joining. Um, Dr. Passman, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I know you'll be meeting with some of our faculty and fellows over the next couple of hours. So thank you again and everybody thank you. have the rest of your day and a great week. Thank you. Bye-bye.
The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.